chapter 14. I'd like to spend a few moments there in the bit of time we have left today. In Luke chapter 14, we'll find our Lord teaching there. Now, whenever I was in junior high school, so that was 6th grade, 7th grade, I remember a phrase that was fairly common. It was in advertisements. It was in like little animated things. And it was a picture of two masks. One was happy and, and it looked like he was laughing. The other one was sad and, and crying. Well, the phrase beneath that was, smile now, cry later. And that, that idea has kind of morphed into different things. I think more more recent idea of that is the, the YOLO movement. You only live once. But many people take this idea and that really turns into their battle cry, their way of living. Smile now, cry later. Well, in Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 25, we find our Lord teaching about some costs of discipleship. Beginning in verse 25, he there says, And there went a great, or great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross, and come after me, cannot be my disciple. Well, the, I would note here that the word for hate is not, you know, you're not having bitter thoughts towards your family. You're not wishing them harm. It's the idea of loving that individual less than something else. In this instance, Jesus is saying we need to love the truth, God, and even Him more than our own blood relatives. Many today have this issue where if mom and daddy taught one thing and they find the truth out, they don't want to ever go against their family. And Jesus uses this as an example of a cost of discipleship. When we find the truth, the only reasonable thing left to do is to obey it. Even if it goes against what mom and daddy teach. Now ideally, this is what they're teaching as well. But in order to be a good and useful disciple of Christ, sometimes we need to reject our family. To one extent or another. We need to love Christ more than our family. And this never really ceases to be a cost of discipleship. Sometimes a family who has been specifically Christian. They've lived in obedience and harmony with the New Testament. But through the years they've become unfaithful. We are to still love them less should still love them. We want the highest good for them. But perhaps fellowship needs to be withdrawn. We need to stop associating with them as much because they don't love God as they once did and love God as they should and ought and as we do. So that never ceases to be a cost of discipleship. That's not an easy thing. But Jesus says it is necessary. If you don't do these things, he says, you cannot be my disciple. Verse 28 through 30, he continues, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it? Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. It's an interesting idea that Jesus brings up in this context, but it's the idea that when we set out to start something, say in this instance become a disciple, we need to follow through with it. But more importantly, we need to count the cost, as he said in verse 28, really before we even attempt to do so. 
You see, being a disciple of Christ, being a Christian, is costly. It's going to cost us a lot of different things in this life. As we just pointed out, it could cost us our family. It could cost us the world's riches. It could cost us prestige and everything that goes along with it. But at the end, we need to be able to be found faithful. We need to be able to be a disciple of Christ. We should not allow those things to get in our way. But it is something we need to consider is, am I up for this task? And if you're not, why not? The idea would be to be up for that task of discipleship. Do what is necessary to grow to the point where you can be faithful to God. He continues in verse 31. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a far way off, he sendeth an ambassage, and desireth conditions of peace. This, I would say, would be building upon the last point that Jesus makes following through with what we set out to accomplish. But we still need to understand the cost of this discipleship and realize the folly when we do not. How foolish is it when this king decides to go to war with 10,000 and is about to meet him with 20,000, be against 20,000? Well, that doesn't make any kind of sense and and hand combat and combat like they would have engaged in in those days we, we must realize that as a Christian a disciple of Christ we are engaged in spiritual warfare every day of our lives that does not stop well we know from other passages that if God be for us who can be against us if we're not willing to take up the fight with the enemy perhaps being a Christian is not for us obviously we want all men everywhere to be saved but people need to be prepared to accept this cost and we as Christians need to realize that there is still a cost for us to pay and sometimes that might mean that we take up the fight with the enemy and it might cost us different things in this life but ultimately, we're working toward that which we find in verse 33. Salvation will cost us everything that we have and are. Our Lord there says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. The cost of our salvation took the blood of Jesus. coming. He came from heaven, came to the earth, suffered and died for us so that we might have that salvation offered but in order for us to accept that there's something we must do it's freely given if I put twenty dollars on the table here I just put my whole wallet that's about what it's worth any of you are welcome to come get that, that that's a gift I have a taker Oh. Well, none of you are wanting my, my wallet. What's, what's wrong with it? It's just slightly used. A little bit of an embellishment. You still have to do something to come get it. Salvation has been offered to all of us. But until we're willing to give up everything that we have, everything that we are, see, I'm taking it away now, we cannot be a disciple of Christ. And as we wrap this up, I'd like to consider Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26. It says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what man is a, or what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world, and lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, the obvious answer is nothing. It's nothing. 
Our soul is the most precious thing that we possess. Really, it's who we are. We're not a body with a spirit. We're a spirit with a body. And how we live in this life is going to determine where we go. So if you counted the cost, if you're not a Christian, it's not something to take lightly. Becoming a Christian is the most important decision you will ever make. Being faithful to God is going to have eternal consequences. So the idea of smiling now and crying later, living what most people would consider your best life now, is usually a life engaged in sin. And that will only lead to one eternal destination, that is hell. But denying your own self, denying all these different comforts that we might enjoy, being faithful to God ultimately brings heaven. So if you're not a Christian, why not take that step? Count the cost. Take that step, become a Christian. If you are a child of God and yet have not been acting like a, a Christian, reevaluate yourself. Become faithful again. Put away that sin. Confess and repent and be baptized. Or excuse me, and we'll pray for you. And may this also spur each of us on to continue reevaluating, counting the cost. Sometimes we need to adjust the way we're doing things. Not necessarily doing anything wrong, but let's grow. We need to be better. There's, all, there's no such thing as reading or reaching perfection in our, our manner of doing things. We, there's always room to grow. Speaking of myself, obviously, there's plenty of places I can grow in. So if you have a need of either of these things, please let it be known as together we stand and sing.